Hello, and welcome to the Learn Pali channel, and to this Pali language tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to look at both time and aspect in the Pali language, and this continues the theme of the last tutorial on the 12 tenses of English. And importantly, we're going to look at how participles fit into this picture. When I first started learning Pali, I found that the lessons on participle use were very confusing. So hopefully this tutorial will give you a better comprehension of how participles are used within the context of finite verb tenses. But before this we have to set the scene, so I'm going to spend some time comparing the verb aspect of Sanskrit and that of Ancient Greek in order to get a better grasp of that of Pali. And along the way, we'll find out what those terms like perfect, imperfect and aorist actually mean. But first, let's recap what verb aspect is and how it works in English. The main verb of a sentence, as well as telling us what happened, also tells us something about when the event happened. And this verb is often called finite, meaning that it's limited in time or that it carries the tense of the statement. So we can say, I write, I wrote, or I will write. These are actually just simple statements of fact, indicating when, but not saying much about how they happened. Whereas we could say, I am writing, I was writing, or I will be writing, to indicate ongoing activity, an action that continues. Or, I have written, I had written, and I will have written, to indicate a completed activity, or one that is no longer continuing. And this feature of verbs is called aspect. Aspect tells us about the status of the activity. And in English, there are three aspects. The simple, the imperfective, which is also sometimes called the continuous, and the perfective. And in English, we do this through the use of both inflection and combinations of participles with auxiliary verbs. And this combining of verbs instead of inflection is called periphrasis. In fact, it's only the simple past and simple present which are indicated through inflection alone. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this, as this has been covered in a previous tutorial, but I just want to highlight that the continuous aspect is formed by a version of the verb to be and a present participle, and what we call the perfective aspect is formed by a version of the verb to have and a past participle. The term perfective actually comes from the Latin perfectus, meaning completed or whole. So there are two points which are important here. The first is that past and present participles are a bit of a misnomer. In actual fact, they can be used to represent any time period. The present participle is used for the continuous aspect and the past participle for the perfective aspect, and as we'll see later, the past participle can also be used for the passive voice. The second point is, as we've seen, there are two ways to indicate the tense of a statement. One is through direct inflection of the verb, and the other is periphrasis, a verb combination. Now when we come to look at Pali, we find that the Pali language has several inflected verb forms, and not just the two. And the names for these inflections are actually taken from Sanskrit grammar. So we're going to step back and look at these now. Ancient grammarians divided the words of Sanskrit into four groups. Those that inflected for case, which we call nouns. Those that inflected for tense, which we call verbs. And two groups which don't take inflection. Those which form prefixes, usually to verbs. And a group of invariant words, which we also call indeclinables. Now, the class of words inflected for tense can be further divided into groups based on their method of inflection. And these groups are usually called tenses. And the names can be roughly translated as what's occurring, of today, not of today, out of sight, what will become, the fifth, the seventh, and the condition. But it's more usual to give these groups their names as they align with the Greek tenses. Now you should realise that although these terms are called tenses, they're actually just alternative sets of derivation. For instance, 
present tense verbs are based on the present stem and take a set of personal endings which are termed the primary endings, whereas the aorist is characterised by the augment prefix added to a verb root and the set of personal endings it takes is termed secondary. And there's another tutorial explaining verb inflection if you need a refresher on these terms. The imperfect is similar to the aorist but is based on the present stem rather than the root but also takes the augment and the secondary endings. In fact it's sometimes referred to as the aorist of the present stem. And remember here we're talking about Sanskrit. Whilst the perfect is marked by what's called reduplication of the root with the addition of a special set of personal endings. Finally, the future is marked with an infix applied to the root and the primary set of personal endings. And the remaining three are what we'd call moods in English, moods being classed as tenses in Pali. Now it's crucial to understand, and I don't think I've seen this explained clearly in any Pali grammar guide, that these so-called tenses are named because they're consistent with the inflection schemes of other Indo-European languages specifically Greek, and not because of their meaning. What I mean by this is that the Greek tenses have specific grammatical meanings in terms of time and aspect. So for instance the Auris tense in ancient Greek has roughly the same meaning as the simple past in English. The imperfect roughly maps to the past continuous, whilst the perfect is the present perfective. In ancient Greek, the present tense makes no distinction between the continuous present and the simple present, and I think the same is true of the future as well. Finally, ancient Greek has two more tenses, those of the pluperfect and the future perfect. And now we can see that there's an obvious problem here. The ancient grammarian Panini, when he was describing Sanskrit, he actually didn't use the same concepts of time and aspect as those used in ancient Greek. Instead, he divided the tenses of Sanskrit into the non-past, the recent past of today, and the remote past, before today, but also into events that were witnessed by the speaker and those which weren't, although this last distinction isn't always found in practice. So the aorist in Sanskrit is used to describe events of the recent past, and the imperfect is used for historical past, in a narrative sense, to recount things seen. Whilst the perfect tense in Sanskrit is one of historical narrative but outside the direct experience of the narrator, and as a consequence first and second person forms are rare as it's not used for direct speech. So now if we compare these Sanskrit tenses to those of ancient Greek, we know that the aorist, the imperfect and the perfect are all general past tenses, but in Sanskrit the imperfect has no specific imperfective meaning. Unlike its Greek and Latin counterpart, the imperfect is actually neutral in aspect, allowing for both imperfective and perfective interpretations. Likewise the Sanskrit perfect tense is not used in a perfective sense, but as an historical past like the imperfect, whilst the aorist tense in Sanskrit is one of simple past, but because it represents the recent past, it overlaps greatly with the meaning of the present perfect in English. However, like their Greek counterparts, both the present and the future tense overlap the simple and the continuous aspects. So there's a great danger here in that when we see a tense in either Pali or Sanskrit called, let's say, the aorist, we might be tempted to assume it will have the same grammatical characteristics as it does in either Greek or Latin, right? Because it's called the same. Well, obviously no. The tenses in Pali and Sanskrit take these names because of the similarity in their derivation and not because of their meaning. And this also leads to the problem that the terms imperfect, perfect, etc. can be used in one of two ways, either to indicate the class of derivation or to indicate a grammatical aspect. And these two meanings are often conflated in Pali grammar guides. So now we come to the inflectional tenses of Pali. Like Sanskrit and also Greek, the present tense in Pali makes no distinction 
between the simple present and the continuous present. So, for instance, passati can mean both he sees and he is seeing. And I think this is true of the future tense inflection in Pali as well. It's also worth noting that the future inflection in Pali can be used just to indicate amazement or wonderment in the present time. And the present inflection in many narratives in Pali is used to refer to past events. And this so-called historic present is very frequent in Pali, where adverbs or some other linguistic device is used to set the time period of the passage as a whole, even though the passage itself is in the present tense. And we'll look at this a bit later in this tutorial. Now the three forms which convey past time reference, the imperfect, the perfect and the oris, occur in Pali texts but with much reduced influence. The so-called perfect inflection is extremely rare, except for the verb root a to say, which is only found in the third person. And this perfect form can take either present or past meaning, either he says or he said. Whereas the imperfect and the aorist as separate inflections have become hopelessly mixed up. And most grammar guides now for Pali treat them as a single tense, which is labelled aorist. Even the idea that the aorist is formed on the root and the imperfect on the present stem doesn't really hold in Pali. And in terms of meaning, this aorist tense can take either simple past, continuous past, or present perfect meanings. So the word passi can mean he saw, he was seeing, or he has seen. And this brings us to my second crucial point, which is this diagram only represents the finite verb inflections. And the Pali grammar guides seem preoccupied with these inflectional classes and almost totally ignore periphrastic verb constructions. If we were to treat English like this, we'd come to the conclusion that there were only two tenses in the English language. The only brief sections I've found are in Warder's Introduction to Pali, where he spends part of Lesson 24 looking at auxiliary verbs, and Wilhelm Geiger in his Pali Grammar, although he states that the various periphrastic constructions are of great importance, he then barely devotes two pages to the subject. If anyone has more information or has an opinion on this subject, please mention it in the comments below. So what follows now is my reading of Warder and Geiger, together with what I've gleaned from analyses of aspect in the Sanskrit language. OK, so the aorist inflection, although it represents past action, its usage is actually comparatively infrequent compared to that of the past participle. In fact, the past participle has generally displaced these inflectional past tenses, especially along that perfective aspect. So when you read in the grammar guides that the perfect has almost completely disappeared in Pali, this applies to the perfect as an inflection and not as a tense. The perfective aspect can and is formed in Pali by periphrasis, that is, the use of auxiliary verbs with a past participle. Well now, this brings us to part two of this tutorial, where we're going to look at periphrasis in the Pali language, and specifically the perfective aspect. So the perfective is formed in Pali by a combination of a past participle with an auxiliary verb, which can take one of three forms, and these are the verbs meaning to be in Pali. As the dictionary listings for these verbs are somewhat hmm, disjointed, I'm going to flash up very quickly paradigm tables for each of them now, and there are links down in the description below. And each one of these three verbs has a slightly different use, and we'll look at each one in turn. Note with forms of ati, the third person is used in a special way, specifically to emphasize the existence of something. So I don't believe the third person gets used as an auxiliary in periphrasis. Now, participles can get used in many ways, but when they are used as a finite verb, they will be in nominative case and they decline like adjectives, and so will agree in number and gender with their subject, whilst the auxiliary agrees in person and number with the subject. So these are the longhand form of I have arrived and you have arrived. 
But as we've seen in Pali before, because verbs agree in person with their subject, any specific pronoun often gets dropped. And you might also find that the leading A of verbs like ati is often a leadered, as the sounds of these words tend to run into one another. And conversely, you might find that the pronoun is included, but the auxiliary is dropped. So we have three different ways of forming the same sentence. And the auxiliary verb is nearly always omitted when the subject is in the third person. Now when a form of ati is used as an auxiliary, or when a past participle stands alone as a finite verb, this tends to indicate the present perfect tense. And we often tend to find first and second person forms of ati used in direct speech, and therefore referring to something which has just happened, hence the present perfect aspect. So when forms of ati are used as auxiliary verbs, the meaning is one of present perfect, whereas if the auxiliary is based on the verb roots who or bu, these can place a statement at any point in time. So we can form the past perfect using an aorist inflection of either hoti or bavati, and we can form the future perfect using a future inflection. And notice this is quite similar to English, where the past participle indicates a completed action, the perfective aspect, whilst the auxiliary indicates the time period. Another peculiarity, as mentioned before, is that the present tense of hoti often, though not always, refers to what is called the historic present. And this is especially true when it's accompanied by an adverb of time, such as in the idiom tena ko pana samayena, now at that time, bagavato purato tito hoti, which literally means in front of the blessed one, he has stood. But because of the adverbs casting this into past time, we would say, on that occasion, he had stood in front of the Blessed One. Likewise, papakang ditti gatang upanang hoti, which means, a bad opinion has arisen, but in combination with the adverbs, we would render this, on that occasion, a bad opinion had arisen. So, although literally, the auxiliary verbs indicate the present time, the adverbs or other linguistic device sets the time period, casting the whole statement, or series of statements, into past time. Now, another peculiarity of past participles is that they can take an active or passive meaning, and this affects the way that we render them into English. So far, we've been looking at participles in the active voice. Active voice past participles are usually derived from what we call intransitive verbs, and often from verbs of motion. Now, if you remember, the passive voice is where the subject of the verb undergoes the action. And a good indication of this is if the agent of the action can be added to the end using the preposition by. So, passive voice participles are formed on transitive verbs because they must be able to take an object. The main difference from our point of view is that when we render them into English, they have slightly different forms. So with the perfective aspect, where the active voice takes a form of the verb to have and a past participle, the passive voice uses a form of the verb to have plus the auxiliary been and a past participle. And the majority of past participles take this natural passive meaning. So when rendering past participles, it's important to recognise whether the action is being performed by the subject or the subject is enduring the action. And similar to the past passive participle is what's called the future passive participle. So if we take the example, the road has been travelled, we can form the same sentence but with a future passive participle. And these participles have quite a wide range of meanings from capable of to should be or ought to be done. And these two are often used in periphrasis with forms of hoti and bavati. So in the present, we would get the road has to be travelled, but you may also find them with a future inflected auxiliary verb, in which case this would be rendered the road will have to be travelled. 
And now, one final important point. Watch out for what are called stative verbs. These are verbs which express a state of being. And they often look very similar to the passive voice. But the key is to recognise that both the active and passive voice imply an action which is being done by somebody or something, whereas a stative verb just expresses a status. So, for instance, we could say... I stood a pencil on its end, which would be active voice. A pencil is stood on end, by me, is passive voice. But the pencil is stood on end can just be expressing the status of the pencil. Stative verbs tend to be those relating to perception, cognition, having and being, and orientation, as well as states. And many verbs can be used to express both events or states. And the difference can be quite subtle. Again, the main difference from our point of view is the way that they're rendered into English. With states, English tends to use the simple aspect, as they're usually just statements of fact. And it's often just context alone which can tell us if the participle is describing an action or a state. And this really brings us to the very nature of aspect. Aspect, although often marked by an inflection or periphrasis, is fundamentally a semantic phenomenon. The context of the setting and the meaning of what is actually being expressed must be understood in order to correctly determine which aspect to use in English. And one more final point. We've been concentrating on the perfective aspect and the past participle, but occasionally the present participle, in combination with an auxiliary verb, is used to express the continuous, imperfective aspect. Although I think these are quite infrequent, but I have managed to find a couple of examples. If you know of any more, please put them in the comments below. Well, thank you for watching to the end. I hope this tutorial has been of some use to you. And please feel free to check out my other tutorials.